Joining us now in Ontario, Canada is Edward Corrigan, international human rights lawyer. Hello, Mr. Corrigan. Thanks for joining us back on the program. Now, here's Spain once again coming to the rescue when other Mediterranean countries are simply turning their backs on refugees. But how much and how often can Spain, you know, afford to intervene and accept refugees? Well, first of all, I applaud Spain for, for taking this uh, step to accept uh, these refugees, which, after all, our human beings are in a desperate situation. And, of course, uh, you know, the, the numbers of, you know, 1,300 refugees having died trying to get to Malta and to Italy this past year is horrific. And, you know, the, the Europeans are, you know, shutting their eyes and shutting their doors to these people. Um, what, you know, it's... It's one thing to accept some refugees, even you know a group of 300. It grabs the headlines, but it's in the big scheme of things, it's not really that important. But this brings up uh, you know history in Canada, where a boatload of Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Germany <coughs> had thought they'd obtained visas to enter Cuba. When they got to Cuba, they were refused entry, and they found out the visas were fake. So they tried to go to the United States. The United States turned them down. Canada turned them down, and so the the boat was forced to return to Europe, where many of these. Jewish refugees were perished in, in, in the Holocaust and Nazi persecution. And now we recognize this as a great um, source of embarrassment, uh, motivated by anti-Semitism, you know, and, uh, you know, deafness to the plight of others. So this is, you know, a parallel. Canada is embarrassed. had to issue, you know, statements of, of regret. This is the St. Louis incident in 1938. Now, for the, the refugees in Europe, it's... One thing to accept a handful of refugees, even you know the numbers that we're seeing. Germany has really gone beyond the, the you know beyond itself by, by accepting over a million refugees. Malta, I give a little bit of a pass because it's a tiny country, limited resources. They just can't accept unlimited numbers of uh, of refugees coming to that country, especially when they can't go on to Italy or to Spain or France or other richer countries in in, in Europe. But the question is, you know, why are these people fleeing? And risking their lives, and you know, to get out of, of Libya, get out of North Africa, get out of places like Syria, and here's for the Europeans, you know, are are largely responsible for these problems. Italy, France, England invaded, and attacked, and basically destroyed Libya and overthrew the Gaddafi government. You know, if you were to ask the average Libyan, the vast majority would say they'd love to have Gaddafi back because their country was stable, it had the most highest standard of living in all of Africa, and Gaddafi used the resources to give the benefits of that those resources to the people you know free education cheap gas um, uh, you got married you got fifty thousand uh, dollars free health care all these things are gone in libya because the multinational corporations wants to extract the the resources on uh, and and almost exclusively so what they want to do is you know, they don't want to share the resources i'm sure the the oil companies in libya weren't starving but now the people in libya are being denied that and of course, you've got various factions, uh, you know, fighting for control of the country and for other, you know, to steal what resources they can. But, you know, Libya has gone way back. Syria has been destroyed. The government was not overthrown. But we see similar things in, in Somalia. We see things in, uh, in certainly in, in Iraq. And this is largely the Europeans' fault and the legacy of uh, colonialism and the legacy of deliberate policies on the part of the Europeans and the Americans to exploit the resources of Africa and Middle Eastern countries for themselves, take that, enrich themselves at the expense of, of the people in the countries that they, they are dominating on. So this is imperialism, this is colonialism, and legacy of neocolonialism, all of which is, is exploitive of the people in Africa, and where people like Gaddafi, who want to take control of their own country, be independent, use the resources for their the benefit of the people. And Gaddafi was doing things like, well, there's an example, um, the Europeans were charging the Africans $500 million a year to use at European satellites. So Gaddafi got together a couple other groups, put up $100 million and put up their own satellite and cut the Europeans out. This angered the Europeans and Gaddafi was moving at other things to help Libya and also help Africa to come out from underneath the, the, uh, the foot of, of the Europeans. And we still have this exploitive relationship that, ex that exists now. Same thing in Iraq. I think most Iraqis would be happy to have Saddam back uh, after we have basically the West has destroyed the countries and created chaos and playing factions against each other and using ISIS as a weapon to destroy and destabilize countries. 
uh, this is the problem. So it's you know nice to accept some refugees, and I applaud Spain. But you know the big question is why are these people taking such risks? Why are they fleeing? Why are these countries unstable? What is the the the, the economic relationship, and what's wrong with that relationship? And these are the the questions that Europeans need to take a hard look at, and they put money into a pot to help the countries uh, to be stable and prosperous, so people don't want to live there and take their risks their lives, and also to uh, to help the refugees who are in in Europe. Or, you know, Spain, France, Italy, Greece are bearing the brunt of this. And, of course, we're seeing the rise of uh, xenophobia, racism against refugees, racism against Muslims, Arabs, uh, you know, even the, the, the Roma. This is a problem. And so we're seeing a, a repeat of a pattern that took place in, in the 1930s in Europe. And, of course, that led to devastating consequences for the people of Europe and even for the world. And we don't want to see a repeat of the 1930s in Europe. And there's a lot of dangerous signs to say that we are going down that road, and in many respects, we're already there. Thank you. That was a lot of powerful food for thought there. Thank you for joining us. Once again, on the program, Mr. Edward Corgan, international human rights lawyer, joining us there out of Ontario, Canada.